interactions among groups. <laughs> and so um, it's completely, you don't have to be a scientist. If you live in this world, you know that often people are being as good as gold towards members of their group in order for their groups to exterminate other groups. So the multi-level nature of this just replicates itself up and down the hierarchy. Stephen Gould was sceptical of the idea of looking at nature to understand morality. That he, he said that morality was something that we should look within ourselves to define. Do you agree with that, or do you think that evolution is essential in shaping our morality? Well, I think that I think that morality is can be defined without reference to evolution. If you look at everyone's definition of morality, philosophers or anyone else, there's something axiomatic about morality, which is that it's other and society oriented. If something is for the benefit of others and for society as a whole, we tend to call it moral. If it if it benefits us at, while harming others, we tend to call it immoral. You don't need to be a, an evolutionist in order to define morality that way. Since it is defined that way, actually you do need to tell an evolutionary story as to why we're a species which is sensitive to morality. How, how, how are we a species that can be moral, but of course only with great difficulty, right? We don't, we're not spontaneously moral. We're, we're, we're ambivalent with respect to morality. We preach it, we follow it, and we violate it. So how do you explain all of that? How do you explain us with respect to morality, even when morality is being defined without reference to evolution. You've looked at the issue of forgiveness, I think, in quite some detail, a kind of moral issue from an evolutionary perspective. What is the role of forgiveness in your view? Forgiveness is my was my entry to the study of religion. And uh, the interesting thing about forgiveness and everything else associated with religion, tell me Tell me anything that's at the heart of religion, and I will show you that it also exists outside of religion. So forgiveness, we associate that with Christianity, turn the other cheek, and yet forgiveness functions in a completely non-religious context. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness is failing to retaliate in response to a transgression. If you do something bad to me and I don't retaliate, then I have forgiven you. And when you think of it that way, then it's a social trait, basically, which can be advantageous under some circumstances and very highly disadvantageous under others. And what religions do, what any cultural system does, is basically tell you when to forgive and when not to forgive. So if you look closely at religions, including Christianity, any religion which just says do X is not sufficiently sophisticated, basically, to serve as a guide for behavior. So Christian, the Christian religion is not just turn the other cheek. If you actually look closely at um, Christianity, which is read the New Testament, then what you'll find is, is that there's a lot of context specificity. Do X in this situation, do Y in that situation. So under some circumstances, turn the other cheek. In other circumstances, then there's very measured retaliation. Typically within a religious community, including a Christian community, if, if one of your brothers transgresses in a small way, you bring it up in a nice way to try to correct him in a nice way. If he continues, then you escalate. Ultimately, he's excluded. You hope he'll come back and change his behavior, in which case he repents, and then he's welcomed back into the church. This is a very complex set of rules, basically, for what to do with a transgressor in that particular uh, situation. The Jews were not to be forgiven under any circumstances because they killed Christ. The Roman emperor turned the other cheek because what else can you do? So there's a sense in which a, a good religion and any good cultural system has to provide this kind of blueprint for how to behave. An adaptive culture is receiving information as input, and it's resulting in action as output. And so culture is kind of like a brain that way. So the reason that religions seem to have many core values in common could be put down to the evolutionary pressures which shape those religions. Well, that explains both what they have in common and, what the, and their diversity. You know, 
People like to say that all religions embody the golden rule. Actually, that's not true. <laughs> if you define the golden rule in any, with any kind of specificity, you know, Judaism is not about do unto others. It's, it's not about the golden rule. It's about measure for measure, eye for an eye, truth for a truth. But and, wouldn't Rabbi Hillel's very famous comment that, you know, the Torah can be summed up while standing on one foot by saying... Yeah, this is so interesting, and I'm basing this on a conference on the golden rule uh, in religions around the world, in which uh, really great scholars, including... Um, I mean, just Jacob, to finish, I mean, Hillel Hill said, you know, don't do anything to others that you wouldn't have them do Yes, there's the yourself. famous story of Hillel uh, explaining the Torah standing on one foot. Uh, Jacob Neusner, who's a legendary Judaic scholar and who organized this conference on the golden rule, it was he who said... That, that Judaism is about measure for measure, not about the golden goal. Then he turns to Hillel's parable, and he says, guess what? The purpose of that story was to show how patient Rabbi Hillel was answering idiotic questions as part of a series of stories in which people keep bugging him about. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you actually take a look at the whole religion, then this, this, um, uh, the, the, the golden rule, as you would narrowly interpret it, uh, is really just not a good description of, of um, Judaism. It's not a good description of any religion. I mean, my contribution to that volume was the golden rules of religion, plural. Any good religion has to provide lots of rules, not just, not just one. Is it surprising that in a country like New Zealand, where we're basically a secular country, the number of people that go to church has dropped incredibly dramatically over the last century, I suppose? Right. At the beginning, you might have said that was being replaced by other forms of belief, the union movement, the socialist movement, and so on. But now we live in a time when most people belong to very little. They don't have strong union movement. They don't have a church they go to. And we're kind of individuals. Is that a surprising thing? Or how do you figure that out into the evolutionary? Well, excellent. Uh, again, I, our time is brief, but there's very good social science research behind uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying here. And the, the, the key environmental variable is called existential security. Uh, you are lucky to live in an environment of high existential security, which means that you're safe and secure. You can expect to live to a ripe old age. You can educate yourself. You can wait until your early 30s to have kids. Um, great health care. This is a situation in which there's a sense in which you don't need God <laughs> and you don't need much else in terms of active belief and, and organization. You can afford to be individuals. You can experiment. Uh, you can try new things. It's just the, that is the niche for liberalism. Now, go to the opposite extreme of existential insecurity, such as the Middle East. That's the sense in which you need a, a very, very strong religion in, for fundamentalism in order to band together for collective action because your life and the life of your culture is at stake. So if you look around the world, you can, you can easily categorize cultures uh, along this axis of existential security. And the degree of secularization and within religions, liberalization, uh, is very tightly correlated with existential security. So New Zealand, Scandinavia, the really safe and secure places are... Um, are non-religious. They become secular. In America, what, because of the lack of the welfare state, the fact that people don't have health insurance, that's why they all believe in God? Well, not everyone believes in God in America. <laughs> <laughs> America is so heterogeneous, right? It's affluent on average, but it also has the greatest income disparity. Uh, I don't know if it's the greatest, but it's a very high But, but by Western disparity. standards, you have an incredibly high number of people who are religious. That's right. And I think that when you look at existential security, insecurity, especially as perceived, it's not just a matter of what your income is. It's a matter of your whole social world. And I think that there's many uh, aspects of American life which is ex existentially highly insecure, even for the folks that have a lot of money, because there's just no social support. Everyone moves around. They end up in some suburb someplace. Um, and a megachurch looks pretty good. You've been working on a project in a small American city, Binghamton, looking at evolution within the city environment. Tell me about that project. Well, more generally, over the last, uh, starting about five or six years ago, I thought that I should leave the ivory tower and use evolution to actually make a difference in the real world, starting in my own city of Binghamton, 
New York. And so I started to use my city as a field site, the way an ecologist would study their organism. I started to study people in the city of Binghamton, focusing, among other things, on their prosociality. So you can measure how other-oriented you are with surveys and other measures, and there's big individual differences. So some people, you know, big surprise, you don't need a scientist to tell you that some people are much more other-oriented than others.